don't know about you, but someday there will be better music than this. And I'm anticipating some great preaching tonight too, but there will be one thing better than that, to be with him. My heart is thrilled whene'er I think of heaven's glory fair, of all the countless blessings that the saints redeemed shall share. But oh, the crowning blessing of that promised life above will be to dwell with Christ my Lord. The Savior that I love to be with him will crown it all to see his face before him fall to feast within his banquet hall to be with him will crown it all I'm grateful for the rich rewards that faithful ones will share for joys and pleasures all divine awaiting over there. For that bright city built for us where angel music rings, I praise my Lord for all of it. But still my glad heart sings to be with him will crown it all to see his face before him fall to feast within his banquet hall to be with him will crown it all to be with him will crown it all to see his face before him fall to feast within his banquet hall to be with him will crown it all there's a special spirit in here tonight isn't there thank the Lord for his presence and for this music that so adequately prepares us for this coming week. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, in just a short time of 21 minutes, we have been lifted up. We have been encouraged and inspired and again, awed with what it means to know thee, whom to know aright is life eternal. And again, we pause in the rapture of our souls in this moment to continue to pursue the longing of our hearts that we all should be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. And that for anyone in this room tonight who doesn't know thee correctly or adequately or sufficiently, 
the night called tonight will be the night in which that person will know the fullness of the Godhead and that Jesus Christ will be Lord of all and all the ache and the sorrow and the pain and the anxiety of sins unforgiven will be removed by the precious blood of him who came and died and rose again. For the transcendent wonder that we've known, just a foretaste of when it will be worth it all, we give thee thanks and ask now to help our natural minds to understand the spiritual things. And help us to think after thee. Bring our imagination under the captivity of the Holy One. As we speak of symbols tonight and events almost indescribable, grant that they shall come into focus for the eyes of faith. And that of all things, Jesus Christ again will be seen high and lifted up above all the mundane and the meaningless things of life so that when we leave in just a few minutes, we will say to each other and to thee, it has been good that we were at that place. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people agreed by saying, Amen. Part of the fascination of the Word of God is its symbol. Symbols are very meaningful. Symbols are more a part of advertisement than you and I imagine, but we are impacted constantly by symbols that relate us to something that we don't understand by using that which we do understand. For instance, the advertisement I saw this afternoon of the new automobile called Lynx. I passed a Jaguar coming to church this morning and I park next to a cougar. And I one time owned a Pinto. Now if you were to take the new Lynx and the sleek Jaguar and the cougar and the Pinto or whatever car bearing the name of some animal, even the Buick Lark, and you took that vehicle and you placed it in the heart of the jungle of South America, down near where many of our missionaries have labored called Lima Cocha, which is way, way down in the jungle. You fly over it an hour and a half. It looks like broccoli from 7,000 feet. Then there's a brown strip that looks like a ribbon. That's water. And then there is an open spot and there's a building or two and someone is waving and that's the mission station. If you would take that lynx, that new sparkling lynx, and drop it in the middle of one of those tribes that has never seen their language written, that have never seen anyone other than people that look like themselves, and certainly have never seen an automobile, and you would drop that right down there, you would have to relate to them something that they understood so that they could understand what that thing was with two things that looked like eyes and a growl somewhere, I guess, under the front portion that sounded like maybe a waterfall. And you would be stuck, you would be struggling to relate to them something that is very meaningful to you but something that has no bearing to them at all. And you would say, now how can I put in words that they'll understand what that thing is? And you might say, jaguar. And immediately they would understand, at least partly they would understand. A jaguar has eyes, quite not that big. A jaguar is a very sleek animal that can run 70, 80 miles an hour magnificent specimen. The giant, giant cat is slow, so sleek and well tailored by its manicure God himself that it's awesome just to look at one, let alone
try to track one with a camera. And you would say lynx or jaguar or cougar or something, and using a word that they understand, they could somewhat relate what this thing does. It moves, it's sleek, it shines, it has eyes, it purrs, it has a motor. And you would be then still not explaining to them clearly what on earth an automobile is. You'd have trouble explaining the lights, for instance, and the horn that you could just whatever. You might have trouble explaining all those things, those wires that, of course, they wouldn't understand. What is a wire? And how does this operate? And who pushes it? Maybe there's somebody on the inside who is... And you could, you could struggle as I'm trying to struggle to you how foolish an automobile would look to people that had never seen anything other than a lynx or a jaguar or whatever to explain to them the whole concept be ta- be, behind the automotive industry and another part of the world and another society that they can't relate to at all. I remember one time trying to explain to someone in the language of someone who had never seen one before what an elevator was. Try to explain to a person down outside of Lima Cocha an elevator. What is an elevator? Well, it's a little box like that thing that we pointed to and here was a box and it had pins underneath it. It was a house. No glass windows, just holes, no furniture, just the floor. People did everything they wanted to do in that little box about the size of the Berean room on a little roof. Now, you try to tell somebody like that what an elevator is. Well, you say it's like that. And uh, then you start by explaining why on earth you would need one. Well, you start by saying, imagine a hundred of those little boxes piled on top of each other. He could probably understand that. Now you're still back with your problem of your elevator. You would say, well, inside these hundred little boxes stacked on top of each other is another little box. And that little box goes up and down. So you get in that little box and you can go to the 45th box and then you can get out and you can get back into that little box and come down and you can see how difficult it would be to answer the question, how does the box go up and down? Well, you would say, you get into that little box and there's a little teeny button kind of thing. You'd have the problem, of course, explaining what a button is. And you'd show them something, maybe draw a picture of one, and then you'd say, all you do is put your finger on that button. And this little box goes up and down. You see how silly it is? It's almost silly that I'm wearing out this illustration. But what I'm trying to get at is that when we look at this passage tonight, we're going to look at symbols that are strange to you just as strange as an automobile would be to a person who only knew what a jaguar was like. Now let me take you from that point of stirring up your imagination to the text that describes for us in just a half a dozen words what it will look like when Jesus Christ comes again and his kingdom will come. Revelation chapter 19 is our text for the evening. Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. Revelation 19, 11. Remember the book's theme is the unveiling of Jesus Christ so that you can see Jesus Christ better in a different light than you ever saw him before. The writer is John, who is on the isle, the small island mass of Patmos, about 60 years after Jesus Christ ascended. He is engaged in participating in what you would call a vision or a dream. You might want to call it, if you don't look at it from biblical terms, imagining. I Let me just give you this as an illustration. I have a a very... uh, pleasant uh, an ability to go to sleep very quickly. Uh, I was, uh, well, I'm going to tell you that because you'll think I do that all the time, but I've already started it, so I might as well say it. I was on long distance the other day with a person. I knew exactly what he was saying, and I found myself falling asleep. 
Now, there's a disease that does this, and it's called um, uh, narcolepsy. That's the word. I didn't want to tell you this tonight. That's why I couldn't think of that word. And it's a person who is psychologically in trouble or what he's hearing becomes painful, so he immediately falls asleep. It's a very dangerous disease and very rare. I don't have narcolepsy, incidentally. <laughs> Otherwise, the fear that I'm experiencing in trying to preach this message tonight would produce instant sleep. And I assure you, I'm wide awake. But I have this ability and... Uh, it's been pleasant because through the years as I traveled in evangelism, I had insomnia and many times didn't go to sleep till four or five o'clock in the morning. Now, thank the Lord, I have very fine sleeping habits now and uh, thank, uh, I suppose, to a happy home. But uh, on a plane, five or six minutes, I can put my head back and I'll be sound asleep. And the moment I start to go off, I'm engaged in seeing all kinds of footage, films, I don't mean films that I've seen, I'm not a movie goer, but uh, whatever you would call it, scenes of events. Carol will say to me as I start to drop off when she would like to talk a little more, I'll say, I'm sorry, honey, I can't do it. I'm, I'm going. She'll say, <laughs> I'll say, you should see what I'm seeing. And she'll say, what are you seeing? And I say, well, there are a bunch of people at a picnic. And she'll say, what are they doing? And that's the end of it. She doesn't get any more information. I'm gone. Now, that would be called, I suppose, what the Scripture says, a vision. Although they have no meaning at all, it has a great deal to do with how much coffee you had to eat or what you ate before you went to bed, I'm convinced of it. But this, what you experience as a dream, or you can do this by closing your eyes and you're fully awake and you begin to think and you go back into your mind. Transcendental meditation does this. And you'll begin to see pictures and maybe little stories will go on and little short subjects in terms of video imagination will be projected on the screen of your mind. Well, now that really is the best explanation of what John is experiencing. Although he is not dreaming, he's not asleep, because he is participating in what he is seeing. And when he sees, as we notice in the first chapters or two of Revelation, this vision, this playback this projection of some events that are yet to take place. He is totally devastated by it and he falls on his face before God and feels as if he is totally dead because of the awesome impressions that he's beginning to imagine. This is what is taking place. And it's all being governed and superintended by the doctor of the minds of men, even the Holy Spirit through God the Father's permission as Jesus Christ is pictured. So when we read in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, and I saw heaven opened, this is what he is, you would say, imagining. And take a look at this, is the word behold. I'll read it, we'll expunge the characteristics and the symbolisms and the comparative words out of it, and then we'll apply it, all right? And take a look at this, you should see what I'm seeing. I see a white horse. Now remember that uh, the word horse speaks of, and it is a literal animal, the word appears ten times as many times in the book of Revelation as it appears in the other passages in the New Testament where it appears only six or seven times. It is the animal that cares for the burdens that are placed upon it by men, it is a vehicle, it is a lynx, it is a means of transportation, it is the principal instrument of war, it is the vehicle that carries the warrior, it is the means of transportation for food and so on. I see a horse. Imagine what it does, don't look at what it is. That's the point I'm trying to make. A white horse, white always the symbol of purity, and the one that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Now, Ronald Reagan is the former governor, and he was called Governor Reagan, even though he was a former governor. Now he's being called president-elect, and in a little while he will always be referred to, not by Ronald Reagan sometimes, but you always introduce the president, not by 
listing his degrees or his accomplishments. You never read the press release of the president. He doesn't need anybody to know anything about him other than they don't even mention his name. The only way to introduce the president of the United States is to say, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. You don't even mention his name. Now, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing here. Ladies and gentlemen, faithful and true. That's all you need to say. We'll learn about who it is in just a minute. And in righteousness, this faithful and true one will judge and make war. The word is not war. The word is battle. Many battles make a war. It is not make war because it is a once and for all engagement. The word is battle. Now back to the rider. His eyes were like a flame of fire. What does fire do? It burns, it consumes, it illuminates, it warms. The word fire is used in 12 different ways in the New Testament alone. It's a symbol. His eyes were like the flame of fire, penetrating darkness. And on his head were many crowns. Crowns, always the symbol of one with authority, one who is the ruler, one who is the judge, one who is the prince, and so on, and the king. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And his garments, his clothes, that which he wore, was dripped in blood. Seems rather awesome, but that's all right. We know the symbol of blood is cleansing, and we'll look at that in a minute. And his name is called the Word of God. That's his name. The Greek word for the Word of God is theos, from which we get theology, or atheist is an atheist, a meaning I don't believe it, theist, the word for God, atheist, a person who doesn't accept God. The word of God is theos, the word for God in Greek, and logos, and I'm not trying to impress you tonight, that word is important, and the word logos is the word for word. He is called the theos logos. Doesn't mean too much to you, but it will in a couple of minutes. His name is the Word of God. That's his name. My name is Ross. Unfortunately, it means horse. Our son's name is Stephen. Greek for Stephen is crown. The word named Bruce means one who is strong and brave. Every name has a meaning behind it. Jesus the name is the Hebrew and Greek word to save, the saving one, Christ, the anointed one, Lord, the ruling one. And this person's name is Theos Lagos, the word of God. What does that mean? We'll see in a minute. And the armies or his entourage, but notice they're weaponless, so they're not going to do any fighting. The armies that were in heaven followed him with white horses, likewise, some kind of vehicle to carry them. They were in movement. That's the important thing. They also were clothed in fine linen, white and clean. There the word clean is connected with the word white. You say you're taking a lot of time with this, Ross. Yes, I am. But the words of Scripture are inspired. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Look up, class. Here is a symbol. Now, if you would draw this, you would have a white horse, and you would have a person on there, you would have fire in the sockets of his eyes, and you would have other people or some kind of uh, person-looking individual on white horses coming along, and you'd draw this thing, and then you'd have this person with word of God or faithful and true written somewhere like a political cartoon does in the paper, and you'd have this person on this horse, and he would be moving, and he would be this entourage, and then you'd have the mouth of this caricature opened, and here coming out of it would be a sword that has a jagged edge on both sides. Now, that's what you would get if you tried to draw it. But you don't draw things like this. You imagine what it's like to ride in an elevator and trying to explain that to somebody who doesn't even know what a skyscraper is. 
So you have to let your mind be filled with what the Word of God is explaining here, and we'll look at it in a couple of minutes, so stay with us. But it seems rather odd to those of you who are new believers. And with it, with what? His mouth, or what was coming out of his mouth, or it, the word, sharp sword, he should smite the nations, the word for peoples, and he shall rule, the word doesn't mean, I'm the boss here, the word is shepherd. He shall guide and direct and protect and provide. That's the meaning. He shall rule with a rod of iron, a staff. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath in his vesture that which is his aura or that which is his garment, his clothes. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name. And this name, other than faithful and true on his chest and word of God on his head, is another group of words, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, we've taken several minutes to break down these words, but as we did that, you saw the process of Bible study in itself. You can do this. I hope as I teach the Word of God I teach you how you can teach yourself. I did that this morning with the word fear. And just through Psalms, I traced this week every word in the book of Psalms, the word fear. And I did that for you in chapter 2, verse 11, and chapter 5 and verse 12, and chapter 9 and verse 16, and chapter 23 and 22, and chapter... and so on we went. And you do that. Now we're going to do that with this text tonight. And we're going to understand what the Bible says. And you can do it yourself if you'll take time. Study to show, be diligent yourself to know the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Let's go back to verse 11 and we'll picture this again for us. Here comes this individual. As he is described for us, he comes with many names and many titles, faithful and true. He will judge, it says. He will make battle. He is called the Word of God. He is accompanied by other individuals or personages. And something comes out of his mouth. And with the word that comes out of his mouth, he is able to subdue and smite those that oppose him. He's coming with wrath and with great awe and terror to those that would look at him. And as he rides through this one who is called the Word of God, he mashes down or treads as an animal would do as it walks over some ground. And that process of him proceeding on is bringing the wrath of God. His very presence is one of judgment and of finality. And this one who comes is called King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Now I humbly admit tonight that what I've done in the last 15 minutes is so unworthy of this scene, but it is almost impossible for you to imagine it. And I don't think the Lord wants us to imagine it in terms of the color chrome or in terms of the visual pictures or imageries that we can cause our own minds and hearts to imagine. We need to get to the heart of it and to the meaning of it, and we find that very clear as we think of the names and of the symbols behind the names of this one who comes. He's faithful. The reason why Jesus Christ comes again and His kingdom needs to come to the world is that because the world has been unfaithful, And Jesus, when He comes, will come with faithfulness. He will come with that which is trustworthy. Something that is faithful is something that is worthy. Worthy of confidence and worthy of trust and worthy of counsel. The reason why Jesus comes is because He is true and almost everything else is false. Everything else is styrofoam. Everything else is plastic. Everything else is insincere. Everything else has an ulterior motive to it. Not this one. He's faithful. You can rely upon Him. He's dependable. He's true. He's authentic. He's credible. 
He's honest. He is the personification of truth. And as the time toward the end preceding the coming of this one takes place, our world will become more unfaithful and more untrue. The world is unfaithful tonight to the trust of creation itself. Man was made in the image of God to worship and to please Him and glorify Him forever, the primer says. Man created to fellowship with God. Man created to worship God. Man created to devote all of his energies to God. Does man do that? His creative purpose has been diminished by man's worship of himself. And the Bible says, toward the end times, he will even worship the four-footed beasts. Turning from the natural affection of man toward woman, from man to man and woman to woman, and then as God allows man and gives him up to his own perverted lusts, he then turns to love of animals. Almost unmentionable in a beautiful room like this tonight. His created purpose was for worship. He sins. His degradation is tragic. He further slips down the precipice into the abyss of his own madness. And he has pleasure in his unrighteousness. He's going to hell and he loves it. How unfaithful man has been to God. But here comes one who is faithful. Our Lord Jesus said, I have come to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. He said, I do all things that please the Father. Dear heart, tonight, do you do all things that please the Creator? Let alone doing all things that please the Redeemer. And so God's creative purpose is corrupted. And so God has to offset that by vouchsafing to man Jesus Christ who dies on the cross and goes to hell and rises again to offer salvation. And even at that, man misses the point and becomes unfaithful. And the writer to the book of Hebrews says, he puts down Jesus Christ and tramples under his feet in rejection of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Holy Covenant. But here comes one who is faithful. How faithful is man to the knowledge he has. He doesn't live up to that knowledge, Romans chapter 1. He is so deluded, so bemused with the imagination of his own heart that here comes the one who is the epitome of unfaithfulness. Satan incarnate, the man of sin, the beast, the antichrist, the anti-Christian person, who through political maneuvering monopolizes the whole earth and then builds a temple in Jerusalem and squats on the throne of that temple and dares to announce with his winsome powers that he is God returning and the whole world willingly worships him. The epitome of the unfaithfulness of man is his preoccupation with his own imaginations, and his willingness to worship the wrong thing. And Paul says in Thessalonica that he believes a lie. And the man of iniquity comes and the whole world worships this person. The unfaithful one becomes the object of the unfaithful created being called man. He is faithful and true. And he shall judge and the Bible says he will do battle. And he does battle with his word. He has a rod of iron, but he only uses the rod of iron after his word has done the job. How powerful is a word? We looked at that this morning. I commend those who speak a word to each other about me. Every idle word you shall be judged for at the day of adjudication. 
He's called the Word of God. How much does a word do? Well, when you've been listening to lies, the truth is awfully sweet. A word of salvation, a word of rescue, a word of reward to all of those who have been in travail during this time of the great tribulation. Here comes the one with the word. He is called the Word of God. And he speaks as no man speaks. Let's go just for a minute to the Gospel of John and look at this Theos Lagos that sounded rather strange to you when I announced it a couple of minutes ago. But I want you to see how important it is to see Jesus Christ as the Word. John chapter 1. St. John. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now what is a word? A word is the expression, something that you can identify that is based on a thought. What is a word? It is the expression of a thought. It is the verbalization of an idea. And once the idea, which you don't know about, until the word comes out, once the word is said, then that proceeds to cause you to imagine and identify with whatever the thought was. And words are so very, very important. You don't know what the thought is until the word is spoken. I have a word. I'm thinking about it. It's a word that you know. It's a word that you think about sometime, especially during the year. It's a word that you sing about. It's a word that you focus your worship on. It's a word that is delightful and happy. It's a word that speaks of life and joy. You say, I know the word, Pastor. Christmas. Uh Uh-uh. I was thinking of Easter. Now, I just played, hopefully without annoying you, a little game. I had an idea, a concept, and I talked about that, but I never said the word. And when I said the word, then you thought of whatever you thought about. But it wasn't until the word was uttered that you then got the message of what I had in my mind. And this is the problem with the Old Testament without the word, Jesus Christ. The Old Testament was the concept of God verbalized and placed through the holy prophets who did it so meticulously there wasn't a single error. But until the Word became flesh, until it became real and I could identify with it and see it, I never fully understand who God was. And the Word became flesh. And the Bible says in the Gospel of John, please look at it, the Word became flesh in verse 14 and dwelt among us. And we heard it, but we saw it and we identified with it. Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Go to chapter 4 and verse 45. Jesus has been ministering and speaking. And it says in John chapter 4 and verse 41. Look at that verse first. And many more believed because of His Word. Whatever Jesus said, it was believable. Whatever He verbalized, people identified with it just by His Word. The man said, listen, don't bother visiting me. You've got a busy schedule. You don't have to come by. Just say the Word and my son will be healed. Just like I say the Word. Hey, pick up that little wood. Hey, drive that chariot. Hey, get those horses back into the stable. I'm a man who gives orders. And when I say it, they do it. You're like that, Lord. All you have to do is just say the word and the boy will be well. Don't bother yourself with coming to visit him. Just say the word. They believed him just because of his word. And look what the scripture says in verse 42. Now we believe not because of thy saying, but we have heard him ourselves and know that this indeed is Christ, the Savior of the world. Go to chapter 5 and verse tw- uh, 24. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me 
hath everlasting life. You see, your ability to believe in God is based upon the Word of Jesus Christ. And if you believe my Word, then you will understand what I am about and that I was sent by my Father. And what is the purpose of my Father? Well, I was sent that you might have everlasting life and should not come into judgment, but be passed from death unto life. In John chapter 4, you had a believable Word In John chapter 5, verse 24, you have a saving word, chapter 8 and verse 31. Let's look at the occurrence of the word again. Here it is a liberating word. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. A liberating word to be free from the spiritual encumbrance of darkness. Jesus is light. He comes with His saving Word. If you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Dear child of God, tonight continue in His Word. Not only believe the Word and find salvation, but continue in the Word. And if you continue in the Word, you have verified that you know the living Word, the Lagos, who came from God. And who gives us life. Chapter 12 and verse 48. The word, word appears again. He that loveth his life shall lose it. But he that loseth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now look in verse 48. He that rejects me and receives not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in that last day. What shall judge men? The word. It's a twindow here. Two little windows that you will look through. You're looking at the judgment of God. You're looking at the final culmination of all of history. The one who shall do that is faithful and true. The one who will do that is called the Word of God. And out of this person will come something, a two-edged sword. We'll get to that in a minute. And when he opens his mouth, he smites the nations. And he says, King of kings and Lord of lords, it's right on his thigh for everybody to see if by that time... You still haven't been convinced. And as you look through these two little windows, you see Word. It's a person, Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld this Word, the glory of the only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. I believed Him just because of His Word. He that rejects my word, that which will judge him, will be the word, Jesus Christ, and the words that I spoke. Because what condemns you is the rejection of the words of Jesus Christ, which is the rejection of Jesus Christ himself. If you're talking to somebody and you say something to somebody and they say, I don't believe what you're saying. What you've said is, you're a liar. Not only that your words are not accepted by me, but your very integrity is rejected. And the Bible says, he that calls another brother a liar is in danger of hellfire. And so when a person hears the word of God and he says, no, he is saying to Jesus Christ, you're a liar. The word will judge you in that day because you rejected my words. That'll be replayed. And the personification of my words will be the word, theos, logos, the word that became flesh and proved that he was faithful and true. You see it? Now let's go to the book of Revelation one more time. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Here it comes. Watch it. Revelation chapter 19. He comes. And all of those that are with Him are also clothed in white and clean. 
you go to the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, and I referred to it tonight, but I must not ask you to turn to it. But write it down, because after the rapture of the church, here's the sequence, darkness continues to become more stifling. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And it appears as if there's no hope. Men are willing to do anything to just accomplish what they themselves want to enjoy. When Jesus Christ comes, he comes to the air, and all the believers are taken up. The dead in Christ rise first, and then all the believers who are alive at this one surprise moment are taken up to meet the Lord in the air, and he goes with his saints to glory for an experience about which Larry Weber sang tonight. We'll get on it. Another Sunday night after the first of the year, it's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, a great banquet when God's people, the redeemed ones, will be enjoying this time of pleasant reunion with past believers who have gone on before, and all of the saints will be celebrating. And on the earth, man is given up to do whatever he wants. And one man says, I'll lead it all. I'm the best. I'm God. Worship me. And they say, good. Finally, we see God. He'll do what we want. And for a while, he gives them exactly what they want. And that seven-year period becomes hell on earth. Man is allowed to do anything he wants. The Spirit of God is withdrawn. The church is gone. And man lives in exactly what he wanted to live in. But he finally realizes that the whole thing is just a sorry mess, to put it lightly. And he says, it's God's fault. Let's bring on God. We finally ought to take him on and whip him since we're all united. And so Jesus Christ says, okay, you ready? I'll meet you in the middle of the street. Get ready. Choose your weapon. I'm coming. And here he comes. And Colossians 3, 5 says he comes with his saints. We don't need weapons. The armies of the world will be gathered at Armageddon and they'll say, all right, now one final chance to prove that man is better than God. And God says, okay, here I come. All I'm going to do is speak. I'm just going to say the word. And those that have been redeemed and have had their garments washed in the blood of Christ, chapter 3 and chapter 7 and chapter 9, they're all with him. Here we come. Jesus Christ at the fore, faithful and true, word of God. And he opens his mouth. And the whole thing is over. And he does it with the sword of the Spirit, which comes out of his mouth. What is that? Go, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. Get a concordance and look up the word sword of the Spirit or two-edged sword. You'll find it in Ephesians 6 and Hebrews 4. You study your Bible and you say, I don't know what that means, a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. I can draw a picture of it. What does that mean, Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit says, just find out where that phrase is used elsewhere and I'll tell you what it means. And so you go to Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 12 you read this, For the Lagos Theos. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Out of his mouth comes. Guess what would come from the Word of God? You got it. The Word of God. And just by the breath, I put in my notes this week, I wonder what that word will be. What will he say? What word? The Scripture says, He shall slay the wicked, here's the phrase, with the breath of his lips. Maybe he'll just go, huh? Maybe he will just in his coming exhale. Maybe he'll have a small speech. Maybe he will say, finally, I will come. I doubt whether he'll go on with long words. You never try to explain truth. You just let it be. If people don't believe it, don't argue about it. Just go on. You start debating Jesus Christ, you've lost. 
the argument, and you've disgraced the Savior. What will he say? Well, he'll open his mouth, and from his mouth will come the word of God, which is like a two-edged sword. Any way you turn it, it does its job. You don't have to hold the knife with the cutting edge down. Any way you turn it, it does it. And compared to anything you've ever cut with, this is sharper than any two-edged sword. The symbol again. What is coming out of his mouth? The word of God. He shall smite the nations with the word. You think of the beautiful words that we will be singing about in a couple of weeks. Just for a minute. Just think. Think of the word joy. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The word of the angel to Mary, he shall be called the Son of the Highest. You know, a word can make me cry. Some words make me mad. Some words make me holy. Some words make me sin. But when you think of Jesus Christ, the Word, think of Him just for a minute. Think of all the words about Jesus Christ that you know. Think of the words that you learned as a child. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Word tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. For those who are signing up there tonight, this is the thing for strong, and this is the symbol for weak. A strong believer. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Think of the words that bring people to the Savior. Think of the negative words. Guilt, sin, dread, anxiety, hell, lostness. Think of the positive words. Abiding, love, forgiveness, grace, mercy, peace. The believer tonight has such a cutting edge in society because we have the words. Jeremiah says, guess what? Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they became to me joy and rejoicing in my soul. The entrance of the word brings light. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light on my path. The words of heaven are sweet. Is not thy word like bread to the eater? Jesus Christ comes. What will he look like? Well, he'll be on something that is a symbol of carrying a person and is a symbol of warfare, the best symbol they knew how to use. And as he comes, his vesture is washed in blood. He's a cleanser. He's a redeemer. He has a crown on his head. He has authority. He knows what he's doing, and nobody stands a chance. All other kings, all other lords, I'm not worthy to be compared with this one. He dares to put on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. And as he comes, he's got a couple of words on him that you can read. 
faithful and true. And as he comes, he comes to judge. He comes to be a shepherd. He comes for one more battle that will end them all. There are others with him. They're dressed in something that's clean and white. They're also moving with him. And as he comes, look. As he comes, look. Look closely. His eyes are like burning fire sockets. And as he comes, look, he's opening his mouth. And from his mouth comes some utterance, some verbalization of a concept. From his mouth proceeds something like a sword. And as he opens his mouth, it smites, it obliterates, it expunges everything before it. Look closely. He's called the Word of God. Look closely. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. Oh, I pray tonight that this very, very unworthy exposition of this passage, even the attempt to expose it and expound it, leaves you feeling so unworthy. May these symbols, this picture, this verbalization of the concept of this vision seen by John, so envelope you, so engulf you, that you will fall in love with him again for all of the gracious and lovely words that he spoke to you. The word that caused you to believe, the word that caused you to be saved, the word that caused you to be liberated, the word that caused you never to be judged, but only to be loved by him forever. May the word of God dwell in you richly by faith is my prayer tonight and every day of this week. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. May these ancient symbols which provide for us some comparison tonight of what it will be like capture us afresh and cause us to properly understand him who comes the Word of God. Thou hast said that thy thoughts are far removed from our thoughts. We could expect that. But we thank thee that thy thoughts have become words. And even though words change, the Word never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that the Lord Jesus, who stays the same tonight, is ready right now. He cannot change. He's ready right now to save all those who will believe in Him. And Lord, I have the privilege tonight, unworthy as I am, but I have the privilege of announcing the Word that is able to make thee wise unto salvation, the Scripture says. The Word that will bring salvation to the hearts of men and women and boys and girls and as I say these words now, O Lord, living word, move among us and draw, if it please thee, many to thyself. And while we're bowed in prayer, will you listen to these words? You cannot save yourself. You know that. Only God can save you. You could expect that. Jesus Christ came into the world to show you who God was and to prove to you that God loves you. And He did that by dying on the cross for your sins and rising again. And God's Word to you on the basis of Jesus Christ who wants to be your Savior, who wants to forgive you, God's Word tonight is 
whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, a word saves you from God, and a word saves you from you to God. God saves you by the living word, Jesus Christ, and God will save you by your word. If you will say to God tonight, I accept your word. I don't want to in any way reject it. I accept your word tonight. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to say these words. God, save me. And I want my word to save me tonight. I'm saying these words right now. God, save me. Would you say those words to God as best you know how? Right where you are, you're not sure that your sins are forgiven. You're not sure you're going to heaven. But right now, you would like to say those words to God in your heart where he can hear you. God, save me. I need to be forgiven. I need to be saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I want to be. Here's my hand. Will you lift your hand up right now and say, I'm saying those words now. I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. How many throughout this room would like to do that right now? Say those words to God. I want to be saved. God, save me. Anywhere else? In this room, lift your hand right now as God's people are praying for you. God bless you, young man. That man there in the balcony. Anywhere else? This one back here. God bless you. I'm going to say these words to God. God, save me. I'm going to say to God, I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. How many more along with these would like to say those words to God tonight, to the Lord tonight? God bless you way back there. Thank you, young fellow. You may put it down. Somewhere else, I want to say those words. God, save me. Anywhere else? Anywhere else before we pray? Thank you. I see your hand. Anywhere else? I can't save you, God says. He can and will. If you'll speak to him and call upon him now. Anywhere else? God save me. I want to be forgiven. I'm not sure. My sins are forgiven. And I'm going to heaven. But I'd like to be. Here's my hand. God bless you. Anywhere else? God bless you. God bless you. God, save me. I'm going to say those words right now to God. God bless you, dear. I see your hand. You may put it down. Our Father, thank you for these and for others who may be debating and deliberating and deciding now. Free them, we pray thee. The truth will make them free. Christ will set them free. And they will be truly free. Forgive them and save them now on the promise of your word. And may that word come to them now in explosive power, forgiving them of their sins and giving them the assurance of salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a closing hymn tonight. It is 408. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. Three little words. And I'm going to ask as we sing this hymn tonight, I'm going to ask the gentleman there, this woman here, that young man over there, and this one back here. I don't see everything up here as you can imagine. You may have raised your hand and I didn't see you. But you said, I want to say those words. God save me. I want to say to God, I'm not sure that my sins are forgiven. I'm floundering tonight. I want to be sure of this thing and I'm not sure. I'm going to ask you, if you raised your hand or even if you didn't and you'd like to do what I'm asking you to do now, I'm going to ask you to stand up when we start to sing. We'll all be seated. It'll make it easy for you that way. You just... Stand right up, and I'm going to come down and stand in front of this pulpit, and I want you to come down and face the cross. Don't face the people. You're not going to be embarrassed. Just come and stand there in front of me, and I'll stand with you and identify with you and verify your commitment tonight. And you'll be saying this, I want to be saved. You may not even understand that word. You may be saying, I want to be forgiven. You understand that. You may be saying, I want to be sure that I'll go to heaven. I'm not sure of that. You understand that. You want to be in heaven when Jesus Christ comes. Is that a reason why people should repent? It certainly is a good reason. 
Some things that I am afraid of cause me to be cautious of them and to respect them. And there's nothing wrong or improper with painting the picture of the coming of the judge Jesus Christ to get you to look at the picture of Jesus Christ who died for you. So imagine that. John Wesley said, before you can preach the cross of Christ, you must preach the judgment of God. You'll never know that you need a Savior if you don't realize that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And so as we sing, quietly and humbly, I surrender all, you do what you're saying. You make the words live. And you stand with me here tonight and say, I'm going to come. I'm going to make my commitment. I'm going to receive Jesus Christ. I want to be sure, and I'm not. Are you ready to do that? The moment we start to sing, you come, and I'm going to stand there. I'll wait for you, and we'll have a prayer, and your commitment will be sealed in heaven. Let's sing, and you come. sing and the wait for you and the Holy Spirit invites you. stanza and I'm going to ask that we sing an a cappella, John if you don't mind or Robert, forgive me let's sing all to Jesus I surrender and on the last stanza as we just sing it with our voices, you come and stand here will you and say I'm going to surrender to Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord, I'm not sure I want to be forgiven I'm going to say God save me come now, the last stanza Come on now, Jesus is a king. Kings don't beg. I wouldn't insult you by prolonging this invitation. And yet on the other hand, I don't want the Lord Jesus to not have a favorable option tonight and to make his proper appeal to you. You come right now as we sing. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give.
Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we pray tonight before these and before Thee, we give Thee thanks for these beautiful words that we have sung and these beautiful words that these people have experienced. We pray that Thy grace in salvation, Thy powerful word to keep them and cause them to abide in Thee, shall be upon them tonight. Keep them from all evil, and make thy kingdom come in them right now. And receive our thanks for the word that is making us wise unto salvation, and that word that will keep us from falling. In Jesus' name, and all God's people who are thankful for these who have come and would like to encourage them for coming, would you say aloud, Amen. God bless you all. Would you go with George to share just for me, please? May I thank you for your close attention to the Word of God and for your spirit of worship tonight, for your participation in this service, and a special word of thanks to the junior choir and to the men's chorus for singing. We hope they'll come back again, don't we? And make this a regular event of causing our hearts to rejoice by singing the words of God. Our offering will be received at this time, and we hope that you will be as generous as possible as we move forward in ministering to this city and being faithful to the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Be generous, God's people. It's very much needed. Amen. Thank you.